Okay. Um, uh, uh, I would like to welcome you to the faculty seminar of the Mountain Center. Um, we're doing it at a non-traditional day. We usually do it on Wednesdays. Uh, we're doing it this time on Tuesdays. Um, uh, we're honored to have with us uh, Professor Paul Shepard. But before saying a few words about his work, I want to thank uh, my good friend and teacher, Mike Preshker, the founder and director. Rabbi, Rabbi is enough. Rabbi is enough, no problem. Uh, the founder and director of Merchabim, the Institute for the Advancement of Sure Citizenship in Israel, who has been working for many years in trying to develop spheres of trust and recognition for the multiple Jewish and non Jewish groups which compose the complex society. Uh, I want to thank him, our, the complex society in which we live, and I want to thank him, thank him for affording us the opportunity to hear Professor Sheffer today. Uh, Professor Sheffer is a Dutch academic and publicist who has taught at the University of Amsterdam, and currently he's the professor at the Europe of European Studies at Tilburg University. Paul Sheffer is also a prominent member of the Dutch Labour Party. In the year 2000, he wrote an essay on the multicultural drama, which was very influential in shaping the debate on multiculturalism and immigration in the Netherlands. And in 2007, um, he published a book by the name Immigrant Nations, uh, which is a comparative study of the impact of immigration in Europe and America. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Diversity and Integration, challenges facing contemporary Europe. And we hope that following his presentation, we will uh, develop a conversation uh, around uh, the question if the issues presented touch upon our society as well. Professor Sheffer, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been here before, um, three years ago, uh, spending three weeks giving a course on basically the same um, subject. I think it was a department, um, I don't know if it's a department, I think it's part of a department of Center European Studies. Center of European Studies. Center of European Studies. So um, driving down here, was, or driving uphill, so to say, was a bit coming home, at least I recognized immediately the, the environment. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you um, for the opportunity and thanks to Mike, who um, intimidates me immensely by saying, you know, that studying and reading is one thing, but trying to change something in the real world is a far more complex and a far more daunting task. So, having said that, um, I would like to summarize what I'm, I'm going to say in seven ideas. And the first idea um, I would like to propose to you is that immigration is not an answer to demographic decline. Many people would argue that, um, you know, society is aging, and I know what I'm talking about. Society is aging, relatively speaking. Um, you know, need uh, immigration to answer to their demographic deficit. And if we look at Europe, uh, it's quite obvious that Europe is the only continent um, where the population is in demographic decline, or at least um, stagnating. If we look simply at the rough figures for the European Union with 27 members, now it is 500 million uh, inhabitants and it will only grow in the next 30 years by 3% to uh, 526 million uh, people and then decline a little bit. So overall almost no demographic growth. If you compare that to the United States, uh, in the same period, the United States will be growing from 310 million uh, inhabitants to 420 million. It grows with 36% in the same uh, period. So we have a, quite a different demographic uh, situation. And some suggest, looking at the rough figures of Europe, that immigration could be an answer. If we look now at the growth in Europe, 
in most societies <coughs> overall, 80% of the growth is due to migration, 20% to birth of, of the native population, including, of course, previous uh, waves of migrants. So 80% is due to the arrival of new comers, but the growth is, of course, uh, very weak, almost insignificant. And there are people who suggest that the ratio of dependents, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea, but basically the relation of those above 65 and those under 65, that we could correct because the imbalance is growing. There will be more and more older people and less and less people to support um, them, less and less people to support the workings of the welfare state because there will be more and more people dependent and that you could sort of balance the dependency ratio um, by immigration. And uh, the rough figures calculated not by me, but by the United Nations Population Division suggests that it's completely impossible to do that. Why? Because in a country like the Netherlands we would need ten times as more immigration as we have today, and net immigration we would need of 300,000 people a year. The Netherlands now, small country, has uh, 17 million inhabitants. It would grow them to 39 million uh, people in 2050. And the strange thing about immigrants is that they grow older as well. So we would have the same demographic deficit repeated, but on a much larger scale in 2050. Then we would need even more immigration, and the Netherlands would grow um, to the year uh, 2100, in the beginning of the 22nd century, to more than 100 million people. So obviously the calculation leads into absurdities, and it suggests that immigration can never be the answer to demographic decline or stagnating societies, because roughly speaking, the size of immigration you need to correct that is just uh, too much. That doesn't mean that migration cannot be an answer to specific needs, specific shortages in the labor market, specific uh, um, deficits, but overall the argument, which is quite often repeated as if it were a self-evident truth that migration is the answer to demographic decline, simply doesn't uh, hold up. And I would uh, suggest one thing more uh, on the line of demography. It is a common wisdom to say about the Arab Spring that demographics, that is to say, a very, very young population, where half the population is under 16 years old, like in Egypt, definitely is one of the explanations of the Arab Spring. But the opposite question is almost never asked, and let alone answered, by demographers in order to think about demography. That is, what is actually the social and cultural consequences of a graying population? Why? are relatively prosperous societies like the Netherlands or Germany or Italy um, or the UK not reproducing themselves. What does it tell us about the vitality of a society that it's not reproducing itself? And what are the cultural consequences of a graying society? So almost a mirror image of the common wisdom that young populations are restless, are prone to social innovation. But what does it tell us if a society like Europe will be in 30 years' year, the medium age in Europe will be 50, then we can really speak about the old continent. But what does it tell us about social innovation, cultural um, innovation? And there we are faced with the paradox that in a globalizing world, the need to innovate and to adapt to quickly changing circumstances grows, whereas the capacity to react to those circumstances diminishes the idea due to a grain population. So that leads us to a lot of questions I won't um, raise or answer, but I think the connection between demography and immigration is a very important one to consider, but definitely um, it forces a society by accepting that immigration cannot be the only or let alone the main answer to demographic decline or stagnation, it forces a society into self-reflection about what are actually the causes that we are looking at immigration as one of the answers. So that is my first um, thing I would like to um, say to you.
despite the fact, and then I come to my second idea, um, that there are huge differences in between the demographic situation in America and the average situation in Europe, I think that would be my second um, proposition, that there is far more um, um, similarity in the immigration story of Europe and America than is commonly understood. Because roughly speaking, um, many people would argue the United States is a successful example of a nation of immigrants, whereas most European so societies are failing to live up to that idea. So America has been vastly successful in the last two centuries to assimilate uh, migrants and to turn into a nation of migrants. European nations are so stuck to their own traditions with regard to national identity that they're simply unable to answer to the needs and to make room for migrant communities. I will contradict that idea because I think when you look at some basic um, elements uh, of the situation, then you see immediately the similarities between the post-war situation in Europe and uh, the current situation in America. First of all, um, the level of immigration in Western Europe is roughly the same as in the United States today. So the average of the first generation in Europe would be about 11, 12 percent of the population in America, between 13 and 14 percent of the population, so basically the same when you look at the first generation. If you look at patterns of segregation, people tend to confuse the discussion about segregation um, and migration with the situation of the African-American community in uh, America, which is not a story of migration, but a story of uh, slavery and forced segregation. But if we leave that in its own right, and if you look at the patterns of segregation in North American cities and European cities, with regard to migrant communities, they are roughly the same. So if you go to Bradford, or Birmingham, or Marseille, or Lyon, or Malmö, or Rotterdam, or Frankfurt, wherever you look, you would find basically the same patterns of segregation and the same levels of segregation with the post-war migration communities in Europe as there is now with current migration communities in the United States and cities like uh, Chicago or New York or San Diego. So most of the time people identify the United States with patterns of uh, segregation like Little Italy or Chinatown, which are much more visible and deemed to be much deeper than in Europe. But if you look at the realities, they're very, uh, very similar. If you look at the public opinion in the United States vis-à-vis -vis legal and illegal immigration, the attitudes are roughly the same. You know, if you look at opinion polls taken from 47 till now, there was always a clear majority in America against more immigration, as there is in Europe. And attitudes towards illegal immigration are even more similar. There are vast majorities in America and in Europe very critical of illegal um, immigration. So if you look at public attitudes, they're not that different actually. And people tend to confuse America with New York or Los Angeles. But if you look across America, attitudes towards immigration have never been very welcoming or open-minded. There's much more conflict in the story of American immigration than there, um, people often think. That is what leads me to the conclusion that if I look at patterns of integration in American immigration history and in the post-war story of Europe, I don't find that much um, difference, at least less difference than is commonly understood. So my third proposition would be that if I look at the similarities, one thing that strikes me, and that is that the um, idea that migration can be understood we look at the dynamics of migration societies from the point of view that migration is an enrichment seen from the perspective of migrants and also of those who were already there it simply doesn't describe the reality of migration. I think 
We can only understand the reality of migration societies and the dynamic of it when we start uh, not from a perspective of enrichment, but from a perspective of loss. I think migration brings with it an experience of loss, and if we don't take that into account, we don't understand the reality of migration from the point of view of migrants, and we don't understand what migration means from the point of view of the native populations being confronted with migration. So, to, to just give some examples of what I see as an experience of loss that easily translates into more conservative attitudes, clinging to traditions that you can quite often observe in migrant communities. For example, losing a language, or to put better to say, migration means entering quite often a new language. With all the problems it entails learning a language at the age of 20 or 25 or 30, or even later in life, that you will never be able to master a language to the extent that when you're born in a language, with all the facilities and all the emotional nuances that you get by being raised in a language and being born into a language community, which you have greater difficulty, and that is the story of almost all migrants, the sort of emotional instability that is created and the, the, the difficulty of finding your way into a new language with all the possibilities of miscommunication, misunderstanding, the feeling of, you know, of being ill at ease because you don't understand the deeper layers or the hidden connotations that are in every living language. And so, um, I think there is a real sense of losing a lot of the self-evident, um, you know, mobility, linguistically speaking. But there is also a sense of loss uh, when you look at family culture. Almost all stories of migration are the story also of parents having great difficulty raising children in a society that they don't intimately know, because they have been socialized in a country of origin, and their children are socialized in a different context. And the family is, of course, one of the arenas of socialization, but public life, the school, media, there are different arenas of socialization. And what I see in many migrant families, and also, if I look at the story of the Italian migrants in Chicago 100 years ago, or Moroccan migrants in Amsterdam now, there's so many similarities that are summarized by the Chicago School of Sociology a hundred years ago under the, uh, under the heading of the demoralization of the immigrant, the demoralization of the immigrant, by describing the breakdown of parental authority. And I think that is the story of a lot of migration, simply parents having great difficulty raising children, the breakdown of traditional family systems, because quite uh, a lot of migration comes from the countryside, countryside into larger urban uh, areas with different codes of relations between uh, parents, children, between uh, along the lines of gender, etc. So um, a lot of the same patterns which we see with international migration, we see in migration within societies. So if you look at the migrants from Anatolia in Istanbul, they witness a lot of the same problems with regard to family culture, or also the resistance of the native population with regard to newcomers, as Turkish migrants from the same countryside of Anatolia face in Rotterdam or in Berlin. So it's very interesting to look at internal patterns of migration and international patterns of migration because they bear a lot of similarities. And at least to understand the breakdown of family structures and what could be seen as a demoralization of the immigrant is, I think, uh, immensely important because it makes understandable why uh, many parents want their children to marry at a very early age, to protect them against the influences of a society which they deem to be either incomprehensible or morally far too lax. And I've met many uh, um, 
parents, you know, say to me typically, I'm afraid of losing my child to this society. You know, saying as a parent, I want my child to succeed, of course, to become something. But the moment this child becomes really, has an impact in your society, the distance between me and my child becomes almost unbearable. So that is, I think, you know, that element of loss, if we don't understand that, the title of the book of Kiran Desai, an Indian American writer, The Heritage of Loss, I think is a beautiful title, because of course it shows the complexities of immigration. And I would like to suggest that the idea of immigration as an enrichment there, it can lead in the long run, but it often begins with a sense of losing a world that is known to you. And I would add to that, that it's also true from the perspective of the native populations. And I'm very critical of most migration um, research being done, because most of the research is only from the point of view of migrants and their story. Seldomly, the same empathy and nuance is used when it comes to describing the experience of those who were already there. Because then we are using words like xenophobia, racism, prejudice, you know, the whole uh, list of abstractions, which I think completely misunderstand the subtlety and the complexity of the reactions of native populations to newcomers. And I think when you look at the research being done by Norbert Elias already, you know, in uh, the 60s, in his book The Outsiders and the Established, I think that is far, comes far closer to understanding the subtleties and the dynamics of that interaction of native populations and newcomers than grand concepts like um, you know, racism or xenophobia. To give you just one example of what I encountered along those lines is um, I was in Pankow, an area in Berlin, where a new mosque was in the process of being um, uh, proposed. Um, oh, very violent reactions, not violent in, in the physical terms, but uh, verbal. People were really resisting the construction of this new mosque in their uh, neighborhood. In the end, it was um, realized. It was difficult to find it because it's hidden after behind the much greater facility of the Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's still there. And uh, I went there and to visit the Imam, and the Imam told me, a very friendly guy, he told me, a very de de devout believer, and said, you know, it will take some time for my neighbors to understand that I can't shake um, uh, women's hand, because, you know, my religion forbids that. It wasn't very helpful either to find this place among this community. But anyway, the symbolic meaning of a relatively small mosque, but still being perceived, not by extremists, <coughs> but by the mainstream of inhabitants of that area as a loss of their known environment, I take it seriously and I won't confound it immediately with Islamophobia. I try to understand what is happening because I see the same reactions throughout the history of migration. And I will come to a few examples from the American story, but if we don't understand the loss also on the side of native populations, and take that seriously into account, you know, and try to understand what is at work there and also how it spills over into conservatism on that side, clinging to an idea, this is who we are. And we've seen throughout Europe, but also in America, all kinds of discussions about who are we, what is our identity, and clinging, you know, in a defensive reaction in the first place, as a reaction to migration, to notions of national identity, or a sense of this is who we are and the perception of migration as a threat to that identity. So I would suggest that we cannot understand the dynamics of a migration society without taking into account the sense of loss on both sides and how it leads to clinging to traditions that would not have happened, you know, because typically migrants are more conservative when it comes to their cultural traditions than the country of origin. Because the country of origin keeps on developing. 
So Turkey is a far more modern place, or Morocco, than you would have a clue if you look at migrants uh, and migrant communities. But I can also come much closer to the experience of Dutch immigrants. If you look at Dutch immigrants in Australia, who migrated in the 50s, and you would visit them, they speak a very strange Dutch, which isn't spoken anymore in the Netherlands, you know. They have manners which are so polite that you would have long, long time to look for them in the present day in the Netherlands. It doesn't exist anymore. And they somehow, you walk into the 50s, walking to their home, at least when it comes to Dutch culture. So it has become ossified in the process of migration because it has become detached from a living uh, background of the countries of origin. And so, in that sense, um, migration has to do with love. Fourth proposition would be, that is the beginning of a story, not the end, but the beginning of a story. And I can see how the experience of loss and all that it entails leads to a dynamic which I describe as a cycle of integration, a dynamic that begins with avoidance, spills over into conflict, and most of the time leads to new forms of accommodation. So if I look at the story of migration in America, the Italian migrants, the Polish, the Irish, the Mexicans, the Japanese, whatever, or if I look at um, Europe in the last 40, 50 years, I can see a dynamic evolving from avoidance into conflict to accommodation. And if I would characterize the situation we're in in Europe, I would say we're in the middle of a conflict. But let me say something about these phases, because then um, I think I can um, uh, come closer to what I uh, would like to uh, argue. So it begins, in my understanding, most of the time with avoidance. I haven't found one example of mass migration without segregation. And segregation is, of course, the most, the more physical expression of a culture of avoidance on both sides. So typically, migrants tend to congregate in areas, uh, most of the time, um, the poorer areas of large uh, cities like Chicago or in Europe, um, cities like Paris or Lyon. Not only for economic reasons, because it's easier through physical proximity to create also your own economic life, to create shops, you know, that cater to the needs of specific ethnic groups, but also to create a, a, a religious or emotional life through physical proximity. So it's often the choice of migrants to congregate in areas where many people with the same story would live. And of course, it is also forced upon migrant community segregation through white flight. I haven't found one example where not the, the native population is fleeing areas where migrants start to arrive. It's almost everywhere it has happened, the same pattern. And white flight is of course a deeply ironic term, because in the end it has nothing to do with color, because the white flight in America was white natives fleeing white migrants from Italy or Germany or um, although they were perceived as very non-white if you look at the reactions you know um, to German migrants Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century was already complaining about the dark complexion of these Germans who want to Germanize America but in the end it was of course what we perceive now as European migrants being the source of resistance, being, you know, met with quite a lot of hostility. At least there was the white flight was for what we consider now as white migrants. Now in Amsterdam we see black flight for white immigrants because the Surinamese who migrated to the Netherlands 40 years ago are now fleeing the areas where a lot of Polish migrants are arriving. So my suggestion would be, it has in the end a lot to do with the establishing outsiders, with natives and newcomers, but color-wise it could be anybody, fleeing anybody, because it has to do with a sense of entitlement. We have lived for generations in this neighborhood, and now suddenly newcomers arrive here with their ideas, 
with their lifestyles, etc. And we don't feel comfortable anymore and we flee to these areas. That is typically what is happening throughout the story of migration in the last 200 years in Europe and America. <clears throat> and I think there are, I challenge you to give me one example of substantial migration without segregation. So I think it begins with avoidance because of a very understandable human reaction that what is deemed to be foreign is not embraced that you keep a distance. And that is true from the perspective of first generation migrants and it's true from the perspective of native populations. My next idea, number five, would be that after that segregation always tends to break down sooner or later, that there is no permanent segregation. Yes, small communities like the Amish or small orthodox communities can segregate themselves and live very, you know, continue lifestyles that are at odds with modern urban environments. But on the whole, segregation is not a stable solution. And with the change of generations, when the children are born, you typically see that in native populations, the awareness begins to dawn, people are here to stay, so the myth of return breaks down. Also, migrants, when children are born, begin to understand that they make a choice for life because the children tell the story of, we are here to stay. And so many migrations begin with the illusion of a temporary stay that spills over into, um, you know, staying somewhere where you were, uh, which you didn't envision as a possibility. So, I think it is immensely interesting to see the change of generations also as the beginning of the awareness of that something irrevocable has happened. Our society has become a society where migrants are to stay or this new migrant community is not going away. And that is quite often the beginning of conflict. The other challenge would be, give me one example of substantial migration without conflict. I think it is never a process that is harmonious. I think it always brings with it conflict and not marginal conflict but deep conflict along three lines. Conflict about social economic, a clash of interests. <coughs> if I look at the story of migration in America in the 19th century and now in Europe in the 20th century, post-war, you see always trade unions being on the side of re immigrant restriction because immigration tends to make poor people poorer and rich people richer. It tends to intensify inequality in a society for very understandable reasons because most migrants are willing to work for lower wages, are less organized. The, the, the old question, why is there no socialism in America, can be answered quite easily because it's an immigrant society because the factory labor could never organize itself to the extent that it could in the 20th century in Europe, especially before the war. Because, you know, when you have an influx of unorganized uh, labor, which is willing to work for very low wages and being exploited to an extent that the traditional population is not willing to accept any longer, you see, especially in the lower ranges of the labor market you see a downward pressure and the story of migration is definitely a story of conflict about social the clash between social and economic interests and especially in post-war situation in Europe where you have a quite a, a developed welfare state the whole idea of access to citizenship has of course a lot of material consequences because who has access to the welfare state and who hasn't and the whole battle about who is accepted and who isn't is intensified um, in present day Europe due to that. So there is a very understandable clash, social economic conflict. There is also a cultural religious conflict throughout the story of migration. And that conflict it can be illustrated very well by the conflict between the Catholic immigrants in America from Italy, Ireland, Poland, who were not at all welcome 
in Protestant America. And to say not at all welcome is really the understatement of the year. There was violent protest against Catholic immigrants, specifically due to their religion, from those countries. So it took a long, long time for America to live up to the idea we're not only exclusively a Protestant society, but we have made room for people with a Catholic background. So America had to go through a long and complicated process of reimagining itself as a society inclusive of its Catholic immigrants. And it took 70, 80 years in, in cities like Boston or Chicago to reach a point of new situation of acceptance took a long, long time. And it took till 1960 to vote for a president with a Catholic background. And John F. Kennedy had to insist during his electoral campaign almost every day that his first loyalty was America, not Rome. And in Protestant America, there was deep suspicion of Catholic immigrants because they were deemed to be unable to become American citizens. Because their loyalty would never be America in the first place. There's a lot to be said about that story, but it reminds me Im immensely of what is happening now in Europe with the Muslim communities, because their loyalty is deeply doubted. And I think we're moving quicker now in present-day Europe than in Protestant America with the Catholic immigrants. In, Amsterdam, in Rotterdam, for example, second city of the Netherlands, we now have a Muslim, first-generation Moroccan migrant who's mayor of the city. I think it would have been I would still doubt whether one of the larger cities of America could be governed now by a first-generation Muslim. I would doubt that it would be possible. But in that sense, what we are seeing is exactly the same. People coming from societies like Ireland, which were almost exclusively Catholic, people now coming from societies that are almost exclusively Muslim, and having to reinvent for themselves what it means to be a minority under conditions of religious pluralism. And that was for the Catholics in America a big, big question that took generations to find out what that meant. And I think for the Muslim population of Europe, the same thing is happening. And on the other side of the equation, for the native population, so to say, the non-Muslim population of Europe, the question is, are we going to imagine what it means to be French or Dutch or German, inclusive of the presence of large Muslim communities, or are we unable to do that? My suggestion is that it's a story of conflict, and that the conflict should not be seen as a sign of failure of integration, but that the conflict is integration on the move. That basically, in the conflict, the process of integration begins beyond avoidance, that the conflict is a sign of lives touching each other, and the haunting question, how are we going to live together, is asked. And that question is not asked under conditions of segregation. That question starts to be asked, typically with a generation change, with the children being born and saying, you know, this is my country, and on the question where you're from, I'm from Amsterdam, now that you understand what I mean. No, I don't understand what you mean. I'm from Amsterdam. Yeah, but you have a Moroccan surname. Yes, but I'm from Amsterdam. So the question, when are you going home? Because that's always the second question. Where are you from? Then when are you going home? I'm already at home. So, but then, that is the moment that the conflict occurs. Because then the claim of citizenship is made by a new generation, and native populations have to relate to that. But the whole question of cultural and religious conflict next to the conflict about social economic resources is always there. And then a third element of conflict, and I'll be brief there, is about loyalty. If you look at this, the story of the German immigrants during the First World War, their loyalty was deeply doubted in America. It was the largest migrant community, and after America entered the, second, the First World War in 1917, Wilson gave a speech and saying there's no such thing as a German-American. Either you're German or you're an American. You have to choose. And I could tell a long story what happened after the First World War with the German-Americans, that basically all the traces of German 
cultural life in America disappeared. Just give one example of that, there were 800 German language publications before the First World War, after the First World War, almost none. Because it wasn't a good idea to be seen as a German. Every, people started massively to change their names, to anglify their names. So, that reminds me also a lot of conflicts about loyalty we see in our day, how international conflict spills over into relations with between minorities and majority populations. So three sources of conflict. And uh, I think I see these conflicts not as a sign of xenophobia in the first place. I like to postpone these words as long as possible. I think the conflict should be understood in its own right, should be seen as something that goes with the story of migration. So let me then devote some concluding remarks about accommodation and why I think multiculturalism is not the answer when it comes to thinking about accommodation. Multiculturalism is a deeply flawed idea in my view because empirically it is basically the philosophy of avoidance and is extrapolating the experience of the first generation unto succeeding generations. It is denying generational change because it says basically a society is made out of different groups and these groups tend to pass from one generation their cultural heritage. And all the empirical evidence shows the contrary is happening. And that is why it's a story of loss because people are losing cultural traditions, for example, the language. Typically, only half or less of the second generation still is able to speak the language of the country of origin of their parents, third generation even less. And so most of the time the ability to speak the language of the country where your grandparents came from is disappearing. When somebody tells you in America, I'm an Italian American, I would say 95% you could guess that the person who declares himself to be Italian American doesn't speak a word of Italian. Have you got a clue? what is happening in Italy, and the Italian-American, the Italian in the equation is a sign of respect to a story of migration, which in itself is worthwhile, but it's definitely not telling you that half of the life is influenced <coughs> or informed by cultural traditions coming from Italy, not at all. So there is quite a lot of change from one generation to the other, and multiculturalism in an empirical sense would suggest conservatism. Conservatism on the side of migrant communities passing on, living according to traditions, and simply the opposite is almost true. So even the second generation of, of Muslim migrants in the Netherlands or in Germany, first generation would have on the average five children, second generation almost the same as the native population, to a little bit more than the... Uh, so you see, an immense change in one generation of family patterns. And I would give you many examples of these. So empirically, multiculturalism isn't a good description. But also in a normative sense, it fails. Because if you're faced with conflict, and the story of migration is conflict, then it comes a moment that you cannot simply solve the conflict by saying each his own tradition. If I'm in school in Antwerp, 70% Muslim child, children from Muslim background. And the teachers tell me, very good school, the teachers tell me it has become very difficult during history class to talk about the Holocaust because children simply deny it. Or say, perhaps it was a good idea. In language class, it has become very difficult to talk about a perverse writer like Oscar Wilde. In biology class, it has become very difficult to talk about evolution. Etc. Etc. So then you are faced with the question: Are we going to stick to a curriculum, or are we going to abandon it? And if you say multiculturalism doesn't give you a clue what to do in that circumstance, doesn't give you a clue, because normative conflict, and there are many examples of that, you have to choose whether you're going to accept the headscarf, you know, as part of, for example, in the courtroom where there is. A insistent on the part of Muslim communities now to say we have to introduce religious symbolism in the uniform or in the, the um, 
dress code in the courtroom, for example, or you don't. You can't, cannot do both at the same time. Multiculturalism would suggest to accommodate cultural difference to the extent that you think, you know, as far as you can go. Whereas I would say you are faced in many situations with normative conflict that you cannot <coughs> solve that way. You have to choose. <coughs> so my idea about accommodation, and that is the last um, idea I'd like to convey after this idea that multiculturalism is, in my view, not uh, the framework in which accommodation can take place. For me, accommodation starts with a simple uh, idea of reciprocity. For me, the key is when a society asks migrants to see themselves as citizens, the question always comes back, what does it mean to be a citizen? And reciprocity tells me that the native population cannot ask of newcomers anything more than it is willing to do itself. So, not in a sentimental idea is integration a question that is addressed to the society as a whole, but in a much deeper sense, in my view, because you cannot possibly have an idea what it means to be a citizen without living according to that idea, or at least aspiring to live according to that idea. So, um, the reciprocity that is implied there is, I think, the most fundamental uh, thing that is happening throughout the story of migration, that it forces a society into self-reflection, which I see as the real enrichment of migration. It forces migrants and their offspring to rethink a lot of the things that were taken for granted in their cultural traditions that they brought along. And it forces a society, majority society, so to say, into self-reflection, but in a much deeper sense than philosophies of diversity or multiculturalism suggest each according to himself. No, it's not each according to himself. If you want to live together, you need some common ground. And reflecting upon <coughs> what you need in terms of a common ground is, in my view, much more of an obligation for migrants, but also an obligation for the societies where migrants enter. Because then you cannot say, for example, when there is um, um, a minister in Germany with a Turkish background and say, we are confronted all the time as Muslims you know, it's a normative framework of the separation of state and church. And then, how come that in the classroom here in a public school there is a crucifix? Multiculturalism is typically the philosophy of avoidance because they would say, well, it's our tradition, it's our way of life, you know, to have the crucifix. Don't interfere. But then, of course, the Muslim community could say, we have our traditions as well, don't interfere. It's the philosophy of peaceful coexistence. It's a philosophy of, the, of before the fall of the Berlin Wall. It is living according, you know, to separate spheres of life. But <coughs> I think, in my view, integration and thinking about citizenship is an invitation to mutual interference all the time and asking difficult questions. And we thought tolerance was a culture of not asking questions to migrants. And I think it's deeply impolite not to ask a question because then you say, we're not interested in the answer anyway. <coughs> so to tell children with a Turkish background in the Netherlands, you know, we're not going to bother you with the period of the German occupation. It's not your story anyway. It's deeply offensive in my view. It poses as a very tolerant gesture. You know, our story is not that important, you know, it's relative. It's our national story, so don't bother that much. But you tell them, somebody, you will never be part of the collective memory of this society. And you will never be able to change that collective memory or to influence it. So I would start on the opposite, and there I end with the idea of citizenship as a shared idea of citizenship, and that is why, of course, we, our um, ideas touched. I won't claim that we have the same ideas at all, because it might be quite different but it touches upon the reality or the, the necessity to look for forms of a shared citizenship. And I will give you very briefly element one, the skills. We typically had the attitude in quite a lot of European societies say, you know, language is not that important. 
I think it's a deep misunderstanding not to oblige migrants to learn the language. Because then you typically say you will never be a citizen, because if you don't master the language, to some extent you will never participate in public life, you will never have an influence. And if the idea of citizenship is, you know, to influence a society, then you tell migrants, if you don't say it's very important to learn the language, you tell them basically, don't bother, live according to on your own turf, and uh, we have no expectations about your involvement. I think learning the language is an invitation to involve, be involved and having the skill to influence the course of events outside your immediate uh, surrounding. And then the reciprocity led to a very interesting discovery that the language skill of the native population wasn't as fantastic as we commonly thought in the Netherlands. That there were suddenly, out of the discussion about language deficits in migrant communities, sprang the awareness that the language skill of the native population was much weaker than we thought it was. Secondly, knowledge. As a, what sort of knowledge you need to be an effective citizen? That has led to deep reform of our curriculum, the whole discussion. Because suddenly it dawned that if a majority population says to migrants, you know, you should know something about the Constitution, the deeply disturbing question comes back, have you read the Constitution yourself? And of course, we, nobody had. Of course not. Who cares about the Constitution anyway? And then you can do two things. You can say, why are we asking questions to people who have a long journey behind them and are tired? And have to work hard to survive? You know, asking questions we can't answer ourselves. Or you could say, what, I, what my conclusion is, and what we typically see throughout the story of migration, that you are faced with questions, what do you need to know actually? Perhaps it's not that important to read the Constitution. What do you need to know about the history, about legal norms, etc., to be an effective citizen? And it has led to a lot of questions about civics education and a temptation to make a patriotic story about it. I think it was big, but we ended with a story that was very self-critical. It was talking about slavery in the Netherlands, um, you know, the story of slavery, colonialism, all the difficult questions as well. Not only a story of heroes, but a story of cowards as well. Not only a story of freedom and falling, but also deep abuse of human rights, etc. So that is the deep question, that, and then that is why it implies society as a whole. Third element of reciprocity is the normative aspect of it, and that is simply this, that if you say we live in a society with religious freedom, then the question of the right of religious freedom immediately brings with it the responsibility to defend the same freedom for people with whom you deeply disagree. That is a problem in the majority society who is rejecting, like in Switzerland, the visible presence of Muslims in our society, but it's also deeply troubling for the Muslim communities where there is mainstreams um, who would answer that question. Yes, we have a right of religious freedom, we can build mosques, and rightly so. But we don't accept any responsibility to defend the same freedom for people with other religions or no religion, and especially not for apostates within our own community, whom we deeply despise and make life very miserable for. So I would go to the mosque if I'm invited, and I'm invited once in a while, and say that confront people. And that is why it's a conflict, because it conflicts with established notions of what it means to be Dutch, Christian tradition, the, the, the post-war invention of Christian-Jewish tradition, which I always find difficult to bear as a formula, but we can discuss about that, um, whether it's um, something that is um, a reality, I don't think it is. Uh, but anyway, these self uh, identifications are questioned by the presence of a new religious community. But also the self-identifications of the Muslim communities are deeply challenged by living in an environment of religious pluralism. So that is the reciprocity I would be looking for. And the last element in there I stopped really is um, participation 
the deep problem of many European societies is the welfare state. We have made out of the most entrepreneurial part of our population, migrants, the most dependent part of our population. But that also leads, when you look at it, has led to a discussion about reform of the welfare state in a more general sense. Because we have discovered that the welfare state, not only vis-a-vis -vis migrants, but vis-a-vis -vis the population as a whole, has become out of an instrument of emancipation. In many ways, it has become a, a problem of social mobility. It has been preventing social mobility, the way the welfare state has evolved. And so, the whole discussion about migration has led also, in that sense, to asking the question of reciprocity, because the, the, the high dependency of migrant communities on the welfare state has led to discussions about reform, about the welfare state in a more general sense. My conclusion is simply this. When I'm in a room with people from the Surinamese community, who were 40 years ago deemed to be a big problem in the Netherlands, now somebody stands up and says to me, Nobody talks about it anymore, very angry. You know, it's all discussions about Moroccan youth and this and that. And that is the story of migration. It took me 500 pages to write it, but it's summarized in that sentence. The outsiders of yesterday become the insiders. And those insiders, and that is why it's a complicated story, tend to be the most intolerant part of society vis-a-vis -vis new newcomers. If you look at third generation Italian migrants in Marseille, they tend to vote for the National Front. Last in, first out. So the sense of vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis new newcomers. And that is why it's such a fascinating and morally complex story. Because prejudice, if you want to talk about it, is definitely not the privilege of a majority. Thank you very much. Criticisms, questions, uh, conflict. Conflict is open to talk with Absolutely. You? Oh, you would talk to you. Hey, could you point me to research on um, language retention in immigrant suicide? Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of um, research um, being done. For example, if you look at the Italian migrants in France, you would typically see from one generation to the other, you know, a steep decline in uh, language, the ability to speak the language of the country of origin. You would see a steep increase in mixed marriages. So that is typically, you know, the majority. No, the no you start just language. Because you said 95% of the Italians, was your guess, in America won't know any uh, Italian or won't have, won't, re won't have much knowledge about Italian. Oh. For example, I did a research um, uh, compared Amsterdam and Rotterdam, two cities in the Netherlands, uh, 100 dimensions of integration. I could go into all the details, you know, everything is almost asked and known with language retention. Um, you know, typically, um, if you look at the second generation, um, that's where my book starts, when I'm Tanger, Moroccan uh, mm. port. And then the second generation comes, you know, Moroccan, Dutch Moroccan youth, they come to Morocco for a holiday. And even before they open their mouth, they are immediately identified as you're not from here. The way they walk the street, their body language is already completely different. But when they open their mouth, you know, the native inhabitants of Tangier know immediately that they're not from there because they're Arabic or Berbers. Is there, a classic, is there a classic study on my, just language, that's all that interests me. Yeah, there are, there are many, many studies of that. I mean, yeah. there, there's a whole a library of studies about language, the loss of language or language retention. And I would are there say, any societies, I would summarize that, are there any societies that have preserved it? Yeah, I would, Chinese community, there are specific examples, you know, of highly segregated communities. I'm talking here about mainstream. I mean, if you go into detail, the story of Turkish migrants is, in, is not the same as the story of Moroccan migrants. If you look at the story of Turkish migrants in Berlin, it's not the story of the Turkish migrants in Cologne. 
So of course, if you're going to detail it, but I was talking about the mainstream, I would say the Chinese generalization, Chinese. the generalization holds that for most migrant communities, and that is why it's a story of loss and deeply felt. What Norman Podhoretz, you know, in his book, um, uh, he describes migration, which I find a beautiful sentence, as a brutal bargain. You lose something and you gain access to something new. And the sort of, you know, that Yiddish in his story, you know, that he was learning standard English and sort of unlearning the ability to speak Yiddish and that was deeply felt, resented by his parents. I think that is quite commonly the story of migration. And if the I look Chinese at, are an exception. Well, I mean, and even there, I would say that perhaps it takes longer. But now we are in the Netherlands, we have Chinese communities which have lived there for 100 years. And if you look at the fourth or the fifth generation, you would see definitely the ability to speak Chinese unraveling, unless there is a conscious effort by a family you know, to retain that. But generally speaking, assimilation into the mainstream means also that you cannot hold on to traditions and that they're quite often compromised beyond the point that you even recognize it. I mean, if I would look at a family, second generation, they would tell me uh, in the Muslim community, we are devout Muslims. And then I say that now the number of children you have is almost the average of the surrounding society. So you change deeply with regard if you look at your parents. And they would start to reflect upon it. But for them, you know, the self-identification would be still, I'm a devout Muslim. But the, their <coughs> actual behavior would be quite different. So I think, on the whole, that in Europe and in America still, if you would like to call it integration or assimilation, there's a whole discussion in itself, terminology, but that, you know, mainstream society and its ability to make space for people and that the conflictuous integration I'm talking about still is largely at work. Okay. But I could give you the, the figures about language retention, you know. Example, Chinese, that's what I'm interested in Chinese. <laughs> no. Yeah, but I mean, look at America, yeah. the, which is very interesting, you know, the, 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 mixed, the number of mixed marriages in the Asian communities are among the highest in America in the first generation already. But so in the second see, generation, you yeah. typically see almost more than half marrying outside of the community. Yeah. Well, I was trying to distinguish between social and cultural, and, and uh, America is a bad example because America is so monolingual. Whereas you guys in, in Europe are better because you're, generally speaking, don't you? No, but I mean, we're also monolingual to the extent that without mastering Dutch, you wouldn't, that was my argument about language skill. If you don't master the, the lingua franca of the society you're in, then you're typically, uh, you have a very difficult time from the perspective of citizenship. Yeah, most Dutch know at least two or three languages, is that correct? No, this is a myth. Is that a myth? Yeah. Well, Europeans, it's certainly no, true. No, no, I cannot, professors. with my students, I cannot come, you know, 30 years ago I was studying philosophy in the Netherlands and we had French, German, English texts. Now I can only propose to my students to change the words. <coughs> French and uh -huh. German, no way I can uh, uh -huh. give texts to them. That's interesting. Well, it's, You've it's assimilated. A, it's a bit. It's a bit. Uh, I'm sorry about it because you sure. feel that European integration would be an invitation to multilingualism, and we've done exactly the opposite. Yeah. But that is um, another thing. Yeah, I wanted to ask: did, Has your research covered also the, the Canadian reality, especially Toronto, which I am somewhat more like from the uh, armchair familiar with? And to me, it's quite amazing. Sort of fishing is that happens there. As you see, what I, what I see is you see a, at least second generation make maintenance of the original language, but of course with total mastery of English. <laughs> yeah, but it would always be interesting to look at um, um, what, we, what we qualify as mastery of the language, uh, because I think uh, quite often it's speaking in a very deficient way, you know, um, not at all. That's correct. Uh, and they would be immediately identified as non-native speakers in the countries of origin when they are modified. And I would be surprised if you would see from one generation to the other um, that happening. So 
but I'm not that familiar, I must say. I've studied uh, European situation, American story, but there I think on the whole um, yeah, it is a correct crazy. description about, um, but I would, you know, we have this whole um, uh, theory about post-national citizenship and uh, qualifying migrant communities as a di diaspora. You know, that's a new language, transnational citizenship. And sort of implying that because the costs of transport and communication have sunk so much, that, it, that you can live basically at the same time in different societies. And I think that if you look at the realities, it simply doesn't borne out, perhaps for a small elite who travels forth and but for most people are, you know, the space where they live is also very much. So we tend to overestimate the mobility of people, generally speaking. Just came to mind, in, Israel, in terms of language attrition, in Israel we have two outstanding examples. One is the attrition of Arabic for the Arab Jews, which was... Yeah, but that's not the story of migration. Uh, oh yes, I'm speaking about the story of migration. I'm speaking about the Jews coming from Arab countries losing their language within a generation of thought. So yeah. So okay. okay. No, no, I thought you would and, say the other and the Arab native population, yeah, which is losing its Arabic. Yeah. Of course, well. that's, of course. Of course. Yeah, I was told students it. here that I met uh, were speaking in Arabic to each other at Hebrew University, for they, example. They still uh, speak to each other, but they're losing. They have a double the problem. They have a, exactly, yeah, and yeah, they have they the glossia, so they have two languages. Yeah. So it becomes messy, but they're using yeah, what yeah, you yeah. would call the type of language needed to sustain an intimate contact with yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. surroundings. That's, what that's, that's how, you know, typically the, the children in Germany from uh, Turkey's origin, they are, uh, you know, often described as halbsprachig. You know, which means mm -hmm. sort of literally um, yes. that you master two languages half. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, speak a little Turkish, uh, half Turkish, half German, you know, but neither fluent in German nor in Turkey, <coughs> which is a, a great pity because, you know, a lot of talent gets lost that way because I see so many children failing in our school system due to having been raised, you know, in an environment where almost alone in, at home or in the place where they would live speak, come, speak the language of their parents and are not, you know, even if they're born in the Netherlands, come into contact with Dutch only at the age of six and have lost already quite a few years, you know, which are really essential and um, somehow get stuck in the educational system and that doesn't mean they're not bright and have a lot of talent, but simply due to um, that problem. Morgan, can I ask you, to, if you would, just to comment on the, on the Jewish story a little bit, I'm just thinking about the Jewish people as a, as a nation of people, for instance, who have, are constantly immigrating and oh. emigrating everywhere. But then, particularly in, the, in light of the fact that, they're that as a nation they maintain a desire <clears throat> to marry each other, but they're constantly finding themselves today, or in the last, in the years of, of a, more of an open world, in societies that are inviting them. So like, in other words, America today spends so much time trying to figure out what to do about intermarriage, but in a sense, if uh, a successful migration <laughs> is a point where that's, that's oh. no longer a standard, right? So, oh. there's a Yeah, um, I mean, you think of the story of my own grandfather, typically the assimilated German Jewish story. I mean, of course, if you look at the emancipation in the mid of the 19th century, there was a fear from ort more orthodox um, traditions that emancipation would mean assimilation, would mean, you know, disappearing in the mainstream. And that has, of course, happened, uh, as with my grandfather. He married a non-Jewish uh, woman, but also for him, German culture was absolutely, that was his home. And of course, the, the huge tragedy was the symbiosis that they were dreaming of, was so brutally denied by um, the other side of the equation. But, um, so that's part of it. I think there is much more assimilation um, than we um, commonly understand. But there is also a willingness to preserve uh, and 
to have a continuity and to resist the temptation of mixed marriages. But I think that is a very specific story that I wouldn't equate with the mainstream of migration story. I think it's a very, and that is why I think my patterns of integration in Israel might be different from what I'm telling, because the whole idea of a Jewish nation with all the ambivalences that it entails, and also the strains with democracy that it entails to have such an ethnic identification of a state. But that I, w I would be interested to see um, how the Russian migration, which is, has been very substantial, how it has changed Israel, and whether some of the patterns I'm describing you know, in terms of mixed marriages or language retention or not, or the ability or inability to continue specific traditions brought from Russia to uh, Israel from one generation to the other, whether these sort of patterns and also relative conservatism by clinging to traditions and understandings that have become divorced from the realities of the country of origin, all those aspects that I'm talking about, the human realities, whether or not a lot of that can be found in present day Israel when you look at, for example, Russian communities and one generation to the other. Perhaps it's too recent to speak about generational change. I'm glad it's being written about that, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my, my friends here will know better, but what comes to mind because of what Maury just said is, was it a, is it a book or a paper? I just can't remember anymore. Gershon Cohen writes about the beauty and the, the beauty of assimilation. <laughs> Okay, the, he, 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 but he's looking at assimilation as the one option that will allow you to sustain a culture which is vibrant and of your own. Without it, he says, yeah, there is no, so you'll be lost. So you'll be lost. Right? <laughs> it's the accommodation. So, yeah, but the, the he's really, he's he calls like, he calls, 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 calls it he calls it assimilation and describes it as such. And it, He's, I, to the best of my recollection, he's writing and talking to educators in, in America in the 60s. Okay. But it's, uh, for, for me, it's, it's not assimilation simply by saying the mainstream society absorbs. No, no, that's not what he no, means. No, it is by absorption, it's being changed as well. No. That's no. why there's also a sense of loss on the part of native populations, because you cannot simply continue some traditions. For example, you know, the sort of Christian symbolisms that is everywhere uh, in the public space. So we see a lot of change there, that not simply, you know, you can hang on to your crucifix in the public school and saying, this is ours. Because then there, there comes a moment that you're challenged and that moment has arrived. I mean, the European court has ordered uh, Italy and Germany to change that. Change what? To change uh, religious symbolism in the courtroom, for I example, thought that, or in the I public thought it was school. The opposite. No, no, I thought they, the European no. community embraced the idea that you can have a crucifix, you just can't make somebody. No. Mr. Weiler argued that in front of the no, European, European court. The European court has ruled that there was a complaint of uh, uh, Muslims in Italy about um, um, religious symbolism in the public school, and yeah. the European court ruled that it should be removed. And I think, on the whole, I would, um, um, I would not say you have to force people, but I would say it's, it's an inherent logic. You cannot possibly confront others with a normative <coughs> position like the separation of state and church if you're not willing to live according to it. Then you lose all legitimacy in your criticism. And that is why it's so such a complex story, because the questions asked to migrants have a direct um, consequence for the receiving societies. And they are changing. The story the Netherlands tells about itself has been changed through migration. Uh, a lot of the symbolic representations of what it means to be Dutch are changing. And I think they are becoming more inclusive and less exclusive. And that is why I'm relatively optimistic, although I would stress that it's a story full of conflict, but it's a story full of conflict because traditions <coughs> are challenged on both sides. But I think they are challenged for the better on the whole. And that the loss is recovered by 
and real enrichment, which tells you, for example, the whole question of the murder of Theo van Gogh, the um, filmmaker, has led to discussions about free speech in the Netherlands, which we never had. It was a dead freedom, so to say, because everybody thought it's guaranteed. There's no, what could be the problem? Anyone can say anything. And suddenly, a lot of things couldn't be said or were deemed problematic. And I think it led to a deep discussion, 10 years discussion about what is freedom of speech, what is freedom of religion? How can we live up to the ideals that we propose to others? And I think that is in itself for me the real enrichment of migration. Sure. Well, I found it actually really very stimulating when you put a lot of things in many contexts I can uh, I'll just start with the theoretical notions you uh, brought up. Uh, I, I am not sure I understand, quite understand the difference between what you say a reciprocal model of society and what, for instance, Kimlika, mm -hmm. Charles Taylor, or Walter would suggest as what they call a multicultural society. Yeah. Uh, particularly Kimlika, I mean. Because the multicultural society does not mean that, uh, or citizenship, does not mean that you should cultivate only separate culture, but you have a special space for this kind of culture, which of course brings up very sharply the problem of the common denominator. But it's also a very dynamic thing which can work through the generations. I mean, it's not something static that if it's in this state of affairs in this generation, it should remain the same in the third generation, second generation. And you, or you first mentioned the fact that reciprocity brings with it a kind of critical outlook for both sides. Yeah. So that I'm not sure that multicultural citizenship the model Kimlika used in the 90s is not, is not the same you use now. Now, about a kind of historical remark I hear you. Now, I don't know if you are familiar with Noriel's work on immigration in France. Noriel, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Well, you know, Marseille is one kind of example, but there are other examples in the north of Italy, yeah. and they are much more successful in integrating in cu French culture and in French fabrics of society and in French um, uh, uh, movie and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, so I'm not sure that we should only take the example of Marseille because it's only one example of another. And he, he believes, of course, that without <coughs> migration of Italians to France, France would be different. So, so in fact, what you call now national states are but themselves an outcome yeah. and the result of a kind of migration would change that. So it's just if we are at a point that we want them to leave at this stage, or we, we leave an open avenue for some changes when you when we are for a for pro multicultural society. Or with multicultural citizenship. Yeah but and if you take the Jews, I mean yeah. they have their own space of public space and you have a kind of space which is more political or more social so maybe it's very clear sometimes because yeah. that some of the real cultural lays with the family and the community and sol solidarity. But, yeah. but first of all, I mean, uh, talking about France, uh, Marseille was of course um, had in 1900 had 25% to 30% of the population were Italian migrants. 17th century Amsterdam, half of the population were migrants. So, of course, these societies are the African. There's far more mobility in the history of Europe than the contrast. That is why I think there's so much more similarity between America and Europe than is commonly understood, because the whole imagery is always America is a nation of immigrants, and Europe hasn't known that much mobility. But if you look at it, there's an incredible mobility, refugee streams and labor migration, Already in the 17th century, there were seven arenas of uh, labor migration. You know, people coming from Germany to the Netherlands, from the north of France to the Pyrenees, etc., etc. So there, there were a lot of uh, forms of mobility. 
So yes, these states, what they are, are also the outcome of the, those processes of um, crossing borders and borders crossing people, which we have also seen in Europe quite a lot. So the story of the Polish migrants in the north of France, or the Italians in the south of France, I think, um, for me, they reinforce uh, what I've been uh, saying to you, I've treated extensively in the book, because um, that was a story of a lot of conflict. The Italians, you know, the murder of the French president, uh, Carnot, by the Italian anarchist, chasse à l'italien, you know, chasing Italians was a commonly uh, known expression at the end of the 19th century. In Aigle la mort uh, a salt mine, there were uh, several Italian migrants killed by, if you look at the, 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 the clashes in Manchester between English and I, and the, the English population and the Irish migrants in the mid 19th century. Uh, if you look at the Ruhrgebiet, you know that area where there were 20, 25 percent of the population, and some towns were Polish. A lot of conflict. So that is why I think it's not that much a story of. We tend to overestimate the success of assimilation in the past and to underestimate the success of assimilation in our present time. I think, you know, Marseille is a vibrant city. It's not at all a model of failing integration at all, in my view. There are a lot of problems, a lot of conflicts, but I think they are not worse, worse than what we've seen with the Italians, you know, who were deemed to be, because of some international conflicts, you know, their loyalty was doubted deeply. Uh, wars between France and Tunisia, French Moroccan clashes, you know. So um, the Italians played a role there. Uh, long, much long story, but in that sense I don't think um, I would stress more the similarities than the differences. And with regard to multiculturalism, yeah, that's a long story in itself, not to be answered in five minutes, especially not in two minutes. But I think um, in the book I make it difference between what Kimlika calls a moderate multiculturalism and a strong multiculturalism. My criticism is more direct to a strong multiculturalism because of course you can quarrel about works endlessly in concepts and of course there is a very moderate form of multiculturalism that is very close to what I'm arguing. But still I would think the whole imagery of multiculturalism that is looking at a society through the specter of different communities with their own characteristics, I think it underestimates uh, the vitality of liberal democracy where I would look at the individual first and not at the group. And we tend, in the guise of diversity, you know, to look very much at the group and not at the individual. So typically the police force in the Netherlands, they would say, you know, we have a multicultural policy, diversity, and then you would address somebody who's born in the Netherlands, make him captive to the migration story of, of his parents or her parents, by addressing somebody who's born in the Netherlands as saying, you know, we address you as a minority, which I find deeply offensive and paternalistic, and not as an individual with talents and qualities. Am I saying, you know, under the guise of diversity, you are put in a corner? Or I would say, Real diversity is looking at individual talents first. That is real diversity. Diversity of individuals. And not to say, you have a Moroccan back name, surname, so I know how many children you have. I know where you go for a holiday. I know what books you read. Or perhaps probably you don't read because you think the Quran is the only book that is worthwhile reading. I know I can fill in a whole list. Whereas if you look at the individual, you might be very, very surprised. And from one generation to the other, we will be more surprised because the pluralism within those communities increases dramatically from one generation to the other. And that is my deeper objection to a lot of philosophizing about multiculturalism and diversity because it tends to overestimate the group and to underestimate the individual. And I think with Kim Lika, if you look at what he and Tarek Modud are proposing, then they would say multiculturalism, housing policy would mean accommodating large families. In 
that is exactly the conservatism I'm objecting to. Because it supposes that the second generation still produces large families. It sort of extrapolates the first generation experiences into subsequent generations, whereas my argument would be look at the generation of change. And multiculturalism tends to, to err on the side of conservatism on the whole. It's embarrassing, but uh, we're near the end and we have to I'm respect sorry. the time. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm no, no, far too long. This no. is no. Uh, I want to thank you for your insightful presentation. You're giving us more questions. Uh, no. Not enough answers as usual, but we'll keep trying. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for participating. And there is uh, sandwiches there for whoever is interested. Mm -hmm.